Okay, welcome back. Mira's pretty good, isn't she? Really good. Really, really good. Um, and she, so she started us off getting a good feel for, you know, what are the macro things going on in, in the economy? Growth and inflation, unemployment and, and interest rates. Um, and I'm going to go a little sort of lower level now talking about valuations. <coughs> and I want to do a little bit of teaching, although many of you may already know this formula. We've got finance people in the room. How many of you know this formula? One, two, three, four. That means the rest of you don't, and probably you shouldn't. <laughs> or no, I'm going to take that back. There's probably no reason why you would, but I would argue, and maybe our other four would tell me if you agree, this is the most important formula by far in finance. No question. And to me, it's a shame that everyone in the country doesn't know this formula. I think this formula is the E equals MC squared, right, which is the formula for relativity. In physics, this is the, this is the most important formula in finance. You really don't need to know much more than this. You might get arguments. There is something called the Black-Scholes option pricing model, but I think that's just far more esoterica. And frankly, it relies on this. But this is the formula that is the time value of money. And it is really the formula that we work with on a daily basis. And it's not that complicated. It may look scary. It's not calculus. There's an exponent here. That sort of makes it a little scarier. But for all intents and purposes, this is an algebraic equation. And what it is telling us is that the present value of a future amount of money, think of it as a future cash flow. Present value is equal to a future cash flow, an amount of money you'd get in the future, divided by, this is critical, we're dividing it, we're splitting this up. In a sense, we're reducing it by one plus an interest rate raised to the power of the number of periods. And I'm going to get more detail than that, but first I'm going to start with the yield curve. And uh, this is the Treasury yield curve in 2003. Can everyone think back to 2003? I have a hard time. What was going on in 2003? Who, who, what was the music then, 2003? Man, I don't know why. 2003 is like a, like a nothing to me. Iraq, uh, invasion of Iraq. The invasion of Iraq began in 2003. Maybe it's why we really don't want to remember 2003. My dad says the Beatles. <laughs> always the Beatles. We always, whatever else goes on in the world, there's always the Beatles. And look at the way the Treasury yield curve looks. The Treasury yield curve is a very quick and the most important graph that we look at um, probably in looking at bonds, but really not just bonds, in, in the interest rate environment. And uh, what the Treasury yield curve tells you is what was the interest rate on U.S. Treasuries all the way from one month all the way out to 30 years. So the x-axis is the term of the bond the Treasury bond, and the y-axis is the interest rate. And this is a fairly normal looking yield curve in the sense that we would expect that a longer term bond would have a higher interest rate than a shorter term bond. Doesn't that make sense? If you came to me and said you want me to loan you money for 30 days, I might give you one interest rate. And if you said, well, you'd like me to loan you money, the same equivalent amount of money, for 30 years, I'm probably going to say, well, uh, you're going to need to pay me a higher interest. It's just normal that that would be the case, right? Because along the way of 30 days, it's probably unlikely that your financial condition is going to change to make it where you're not able to pay the loan back. But 30 years? You'd have to be a really, really strong credit 
and I'd have to really have a pretty good picture about what's going to go on with you between one month and 30 years for me to, first of all, make the loan, and regardless of whether I had some idea of whether you were going to be able to pay it back, and I even thought that there was a very good idea that you were going to pay it back, I'd probably say, you're going to need to pay me, let's say, 2% more. <laughs> right? That's been the historical average, 2% to, to, to loan it to you for longer. And so it makes sense that this curve would be upward sloping to the right. Everybody agree with that? But you can see that in 2003, look what the yield was on the Treasury bond. It was very little on the short end. Maybe 0.8% is what you got paid to own a Treasury bond, right? And when you own a bond, what does that mean you're doing? Anybody? You're loaning money. You're a lender to a borrower, and in this case, the borrower is the good old United States. Now, if you owned a 30-year Treasury bond, here's a trivia question, why, why is there nothing here on the yield curve in 2003? Anybody know? Trivia. Huh? John says it's too far out. Nope. Any other guesses? In 2001, the U.S. Treasury stopped issuing 30-year Treasury bonds, and they did that for about five years. There was no 30-year Treasury bond at that time. The U.S. Treasury decided that it just didn't, didn't, didn't need it. I don't remember what the exact thinking was. So back then, you could only get a 20-year bond, and the 20-year bond yield 5.5%. So a huge, huge difference. We would say this is a steep, it's a normal yield curve in the sense that it is upward and to the right, but it's really steep. Look at that. You hit six months where you're getting paid 1%, and it just takes off. Very, very steep yield curve. And oftentimes when you see a steep yield curve like that, economists might interpret that as meaning that the economy is poised to take off. And in fact, that's sort of what we saw between 2003 and 2007, right? To the point where it took off and got so overheated that we were having people get subprime loans without having to put much down, and that would eventually set the stage for 2008. Now I've added to the next slide 2013, 10 years later. In red is the yield curve in 2013. And what happened to interest rates between 2003 and 2013? You can see across the board, all the way from th one month to 30 years, and we see what? <laughs> what happened? <laughs> treasury bought, brought back the 30-year Treasury bond, and so our graph doesn't quite, you know, sync up, but there it is. Do you think it's because of the the I don't know, John. I, 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 I just, I'm sorry to say I don't know the history. I'm sure it can be Googled by anybody in the room right now, and maybe we'll have an answer by lunch as to what caused the Treasury to stop issuing the 30-year, and then what caused them to reinstate it about five years later. I don't know the answer. I, I, I don't know if it was, um, I, I just don't know. It may, it may have been that the, the Treasury just decided it didn't want to uh, have that risk of issuing such long bonds? I don't know the answer. But if anybody wants to run that down, that'd be great. And look how, and so what happened? Why did we get this big drop across the board in interest rates? Not, it wasn't just a recession. It was a global financial crisis that happened in 2008. What was the response of the Federal Reserve? And really the response generally, not just of the Fed, but of interest rates in general to the financial crisis in 2008, you know, it was, uh, it was for rates to fall precipitously. And remember, the Federal Reserve only controls rates at the short end. The Fed does not have direct control over these interest rates. These interest rates are set in the market by buying and trading. Now, I say the Fed doesn't have direct control. They have some indirect control over these longer-term rates. How? 
how do they have indirect control? In other words, they can't say, here's the rate on the 30-year, or here's the rate on the 10-year. What can they do? The Fed, operating out of the Federal Reserve Bank in New York, conducts what's called open market operations. And what does that branch of the Federal Reserve do? They buy and they sell bonds, including Treasury bonds. And that is really the primary way that the Federal Reserve controls the money supply, is by buying bonds and selling bonds. When the Fed wants to increase the money supply, it buys bonds, usually Treasury bonds. But over the last decade and a half, the Fed has bought mortgage bonds and all sorts of bonds when it has needed to in order to put its finger on the economy. Only at this very short end, and even, shor even shorter than a month, overnight, can the Fed say to the banks like J.P. Morgan that are members of the Federal Reserve Banking System, this is what we are going to make the loan to you at, at what's called the discount window. So banks come to the discount window of the Fed and say, we need money, and the Fed says, here's the rate. And so when we're talking about the Fed funds rate, everybody's heard of that, and the Fed moving the Fed funds rate, that is the rate that we're talking about, way over here. Everybody know that? You just hear the Fed changed rates, right? So you think, oh, the Fed's just out there changing these rates. It doesn't work like that. The Fed is just like you and me. They've got a much bigger wallet, right? And so we can't affect the price of Treasury bonds. Austin Critz is here from DFA today, and it's great to have you. You guys might have some impact on Treasury bonds, but even you guys, with how much under management? 600 billion, 700 billion? Small piece compared to you know, what the Fed can do. The Fed can create its own money, and that's what they do. They go, they go and they buy and sell bonds. And if they want to bring in the money supply, they would sell Treasury bonds, right? They would be paid, so the Fed would, give, would put a, sell a bond. Here's a bond to a buyer. Money comes to the Fed, and what does the Fed do with the money? They sort of stick it in the drawer. They retire it in a way, and that absorbs cash out of the money supply, right? Okay, so, so we see that rates dropped precipitously. Now, this is, and I'm, I'm picking October because that's when we hold the conference, and this was October 23rd of 2020, what went on then? What was going on in 2020 in October? You weren't in this room. We were not near each other at all. I saw my parents <laughs> and, and my wife. Where'd she go? <laughs> she left. <laughs> And look what rates did here in this olive green. Well, you thought they were low, right, before? Look what they did. And this wasn't even the lowest mark. The lowest mark would have been hit, anybody know? It would have been in August, just a few months earlier. But I'm sticking to October, October, October 23rd. That's my date. So three years after... Uh, 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 or rather, uh, seven years after this October yield curve, right? And 17 years after this yield curve, Iraq War, 2013, that was sort of Brexit period, I think. And um, here we see rates hit what essentially was their lowest point. COVID had broken out. We had all the things that went along with that. You may have been refinancing your house at that time, right? That might have been going on as these rates hit their low. And you can see that you basically were looking at the same non-existent short-term rates 
But here at the two-year period, these longer-term rates, two, three, five, look, it widened out even more, the gap. 30 years, look at the gap between the 30-year bond in 2013 and here in 2020. And by 2020, March, the year of COVID, the 30-year bond was yielding about 1.5%. And the 10-year bond, because we're going to focus on that now, was under 1%. The lowest it hit was somewhere around a half a percent. So this was a few months after that, in October, but still. And if we had been buying bonds for you at that time, at that duration, we would have been making a deal for you where we would have been loaning your money to the federal government for a decade and giving you half a percent of interest. Is that a good deal? Well, back then, lots and lots of companies took it. You've heard of Silicon Valley Bank? What happened to it this year? It went bankrupt, and what was one of the major reasons it went bankrupt? They bought and they held these bonds in quantity. Now, they may say, we had to. We had no other choice. We got 0% interest here. So we had to buy these bonds. And they're Treasury bonds. They're safe. What does it mean when they said it was safe? What was it safe from? It was safe from default. So it was safe from a credit risk standpoint. But what are the two components of risk in bonds? Really, any investment. Credit risk is one, right? In the case of bonds, will this, is this borrower worthy of loaning to, and will they repay it? But what is the other risk? Term risk or interest rate risk. And man, look at that. The risk that these rates would rise and Silicon Valley Bank and their risk committees said, we want to hold really credit-worthy Treasury bonds, and so we are going to buy these bonds because we have to, we're a publicly traded company, we've got to have earnings, and we don't want to announce zero earnings, right? We've got to have some contribution to our earnings, so we're going to own these, maybe even buy them. We did not do that. New Capital is not a publicly traded company. Our obligation is to you individually and, you know, and collectively. And we said, uh-uh. That is not a business-like rate of return. And Warren Buffett even called bonds at this time instruments that had risk without return. And you are looking at risk without return. 0% interest here from a month on a treasury bond to a year and then paltry. It is still upwardly sloping. We still have a normal yield curve in the sense that you got paid more. Yes, you definitely got paid more to lend to the government longer, but you didn't get paid much. And now, today, October of 2023. I'm going to be silent for a minute <laughs> and let you look at that lime green yield curve. Staggering, isn't it? Staggering. Rates higher than the 2003 curve, although pretty much equal here at this 20-year mark, well above the 2013, and look at what we have experienced in a three-year period. I've never seen anything like it in my career, N never experienced anything like it. But we were ready for this. You know, I'm 50, 
Hannah, what am I? 57. Almost 58. And I grew up, you know, I was around in 1980 when, you know, my parents had, you remember that uh, passbook savings up the street, right? I would go and put my money into the home savings and I'd get 5% interest, right? You know, or maybe 8% or whatever it was. But I, I was around for those interest rates. JC, who works with me on investments, was not. Um, and JC, throughout her career, has seen, you know, interest for JC has been something that's like, what's interest? <laughs> right? What, what do you mean? What is this thing, interest? Right? But I had been, I had lived to see what a normal interest rate looks like, right? And assumed that we could see 5% interest rates again. I had no idea how fast we would see them. R rates could have risen slowly over time, right? But they didn't. But I, I pretty much knew this was a very, very dangerous place to be here. Less so here, much less so here. We'll talk about that in a second. And look where we are. Five and a half percent, you know. And then we have this really interesting thing. What is different about this curve that is now than these curves? It's inverted, right? You're actually getting paid more to hold a short-term treasury bond than you are to hold a long-term treasury bond. Earlier this year, we attended another J.P. Morgan luncheon. It was better than, th than Mira was really good, but I got a steak that day. <laughs> and uh, one of their bond managers who manages a big $25 billion bond fund back in April said, we think this is the time to extend duration. In other words, the time for us to lock in at that time longer term interest rates because they expected that interest rates were going to come down at that point. The Fed was not going to raise anymore. And JC and I left and said, well, the stake was really good. And of course, what do they want us to do? They want us to buy their fund, right? And we walked out and I said, uh, I think we got more, uh, you know, economy's really strong, job market's strong. I'm having trouble getting a plumber, you know? You, you can sort of see these things play out in your own life. And so uh, we have stuck there on the shorter end of the curve. Okay, so that's the yield curve and that brings us back to this formula. Present value is equal to the future value or cash flow divided by one plus an interest rate raised to the power of the number of periods. Periods could be months, periods could be even days, but generally we're talking about years, you know, when we're talking about, about bonds. So number of years, you can think about it that way. And this time value formula can tell us all sorts of different things. If I know what my future cash flow is going to be, and I know what the interest rate is, and I know how many years I'm talking about, then I can solve for present value and tell you what is that cash flow in the future worth today. That's a critical, critical thing for us to know in the world of investments or business. If you're a business that's making, you know, an investment in something and it's going to put off cash flow in the future, you want to know, well, what is it worth today? Alternatively, if I know the present value of something and I know the interest rate and the number of periods, I can rejigger the equation to tell me what's the future cash flow. What should it be, right? And we might use that if we're trying to price an annuity for you, right? We're working with an insurance company to get you an annuity and they're telling us, well, we're, we're going to pay them you know, uh, we're going to pay them $1,000 in the future, and JC and I want to know, is that, is that a good number? Is that a good, reasonable amount of money for you to be paid way off in the future based on an interest rate that exists now and the number of periods and the present value that you're going to put in for that annuity, right? 
So this formula is so versatile. If I know all these other things, if I know present value, cash flow, or number of periods, I can tell you what's a reasonable, what's the rate of return on that represent. And you can see that it works in real estate, where the future cash flow is a rent. Same formula. I'm just using a different word here, but it's a future cash flow. We call it a rent. What's the present value? What's that rent worth today? In stocks, we call it profits. Same formula. This is not magic finance, right? It's not, it's not a, some weird black box. It's a simple formula. I hate to be demystifying for everybody what we do, you know? <laughs> you feel like you're going to go out of here and go, we don't need them for that. <laughs> know the formula. <laughs> you're going to stay. Rest of you are going are to fire us. Anne's going to stay and let us work the formula. <laughs> and then here's bonds, right? What's the cash flow? We called it a rent when we were in the world of real estate. We called it a profit in the world of a stock. And here we're just calling it interest in principle, right? It's a future cash flow. And we want to know, is that a good, you know, are we getting a good deal when we put in an interest rate and we put in the number of periods? Are we getting paid something that's a reasonable amount in today's dollars? To push, to push an amount today into the future, we call it compounding. And to take a future value, which is what we're doing here, interest and principal in the future, we discount back to the present. And that's what's so magic about this. It's a time machine. It's an amazing, amazing formula. And I wish everybody everywhere knew this formula. We'd have much more uh, sound and rational decisions being made in life. So I, I urge you to, to uh, what? Keep it in your wallet or something. <laughs> okay. Let me, let me take a break now. I need to break and show you uh, a spreadsheet. So Catherine is going to help me break out. I made a spreadsheet just to do a little demonstration for you. And I'm going to, with this spreadsheet, thank you, thank you. I'm go I made this spreadsheet to show you that what's gone on in the bond market with that rapid rise in interest rates, right? That olive green bar that was up here. What has been the effect on the value of, bon of treasury bonds from this rapid increase? And how did we fight it off? Or did we fight it off? And we'll show you if we fought it off or not. So here's October of 2020, the low in the bond market. You already know about that. That was curve number three. I believe it was the olive green curve. And here's October of 2023, the lime green curve. Those are the two dates, right? And um, here is your formula. PV is equal to FV divided by 1 plus I raised to the power of N present value, future value, discount and interest rate, and number of years. And let's work on the 10-year Treasury bond to start. The 10-year Treasury bond is the most watched of the Treasury bonds and is, in the world of uh, finance, known as the risk-free rate. It's the rate to which we compare just about all other bonds to see what's the difference between a corporate bond and the Treasury bond, because we assume that the Treasury bond that's, uh, is not going to default, and so it's called risk-free, although Congress is doing their best to tell, show us in finance that we're wrong, right? No. <laughs> you know, and they threaten to default the Treasury bond, and so suddenly the risk-free bond is no longer a risk-free bond, but we're going to just pretend that it is. And we're going to say in October of 2020 that the who, who remembers what was the interest rate on the 10-year? I need my, uh, I forgot my folder. And the rain is here, everybody. So you're in the right place today. We need it, though, don't we? So here, I'm going to take the interest rates that I have here, and I'm going to put it in here. And I look over here, and I see that the 10-year in 2020, in October, was about 0.8%. All right? So I'm going to just put it in here. 
And that says that at that time, the present value, and I'm just saying that 10 years from now, we'll get paid $100. Doesn't matter if it's principal, doesn't matter if it's interest. It's just, it's a cash flow. So the value in October of 2020 of a $100 payment 10 years from then, given a 0.8% interest rate, was $92. That makes sense, right? I have to wait 10 years to get the money, and we're going to have, uh, 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 you can think about it as inflation or deflation, right? The value of the money is, is uh, decreasing, and that's why we call it a discount rate. We have to discount the $100 to take account that we're not going to get the money for 10 years, right? So we're discounting the $100 at a 0.8% interest rate over 10 years. In other words, we're just doing this math on it, and that's happening in the background of the spreadsheet with my formula, right? And the value of that cash flow is $92. Now, I'm going to put in the amount for October of 2023, and that was the lime green, and that's about 4.9%. 4.9%. Ready? What do you see? By raising that interest rate, it cut the value of the $100 in the present value by $30. So we raised the interest rate, the discount rate, by 4.1%. And what did that do to the value of the payment? 33% drop in the value. And this is therefore kind of simulating, it's not perfect, Right, because there are other payments along the way that come from a bond. But this is a simplistic way to see that if you purchased that deal in October 2020 and you bought the 10-year Treasury bond, this is sort of what your experience has been since then. That was Silicon Valley Bank's experience. <laughs> and what happened to all the depositors in Silicon Valley Bank? They got word that all the deposits that were supposed to be worth $92 we're now worth about $62, and everybody showed up at the bank and said, give me my money back. We think your $92 worth of bonds is only worth $62. And that's exactly what happened. Okay, can everybody see that? Now, let's change it a little bit. I'm going to zero this out again. And now we're going to say it's a 30-year bond. Now we're going to look at the 30-year Treasury bond. Back to my sheet, in October of 2020, the 30 year, according to my chart that I've shown you, is about 1.6%. Doesn't have to be exact. Ready? And $62, very, very close to what the 10 year was. Now, October of 2023, the 30-year was about 5.5. 5. Roughly, 5.4, we'll call it. Holy mackerel. $62 is what you were looking at for the value. It was already very substantially discounted, right? From the $100 payment that would occur because you had to wait 30 years to get it, not 10. And look what happened when we further applied interest rate pressure to the formula. $21 is what your future $100 payment became worth a 3.8% higher interest rate and a $41 drop in the value of your bond, which was already paying you a reduced amount, 67% drop in the value. And that is, in fact, what has happened to long-term Treasury bonds. 
you lost half your money if you bought the safe 30-year Treasury bond in October of 2020. Now, let's look at a one-year Treasury bond. I'm going to zero out again. Everybody good? It's making sense? One year to get my money back. I made a one-year loan. And in October of 2020, the one year was maybe half a percent, 0.5 percent. And in October of 2023, the one year was about 5.5 percent, same as the what do you see? Well, there was some, some degradation in the value of the bond, wasn't there? $5 difference, a 5% drop in the value of the bond. So you can see that if you had held short-term bonds going through this cataclysm, right? In the cataclysm, you saw it. It was an interest rate cataclysm. I mean, I don't want to put the slides back, but right, it was going from this to this. That's a cataclysm for a bond, for a holder of bonds for clients like us. So you could have avoided that cataclysm, you see, if you had held short-term bonds, because short-term bonds are less susceptible to duration risk, term risk interest rate risk. We can use whatever words we want, but what we're talking about is the risk that interest rates move up much higher. And there it is, the d definition of duration. The change in value for a 1% change in interest rates, 1% change in interest rates is a 5% change in interest rates, which means that you would see for an increase of 5% a duration drop, right, if it's a, if it's a, a, a one-year duration, a 5% drop. But a 30-year bond would have experienced catastrophe. Question, question. Here? Oh well, it's saying you you get you you might get you're, you're not taking you're not you're not taking any cut in the value of the bond to wait a year. The interest rate is so low, you're going to get your hundred dollars back. That's why you would loan it. You're not gaining a lot, but there wasn't much to be gained uh, under 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 those short term rates. You know, you'd gain a half a percent. You would have gotten fifty cents. That's exactly what you would have gotten, 50 cents, right? And if you said, well, no, I want more, I want, um, if we go back to the 30, no, I want $1.50, well, look what happened. <laughs> I, or I, I don't have it up anymore, but you, 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 didn't, you, 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 you got $1.50 in interest and you lost $50 of the value of the $100 in Silicon, I mean, how could a bank do, you know, but this has happened over and over again. And so the way you would have fought, everybody sees the way you would have fought off this cataclysm is what? So what did we do? I'm ready to go back to the slides, Catherine. Thank you. Yeah. At the end. Sorry, just as we're coming through. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, everybody at home. Uh, I didn't repeat the question. Uh, we're going to let it go, and I'm going to do a better job. I have to repeat the questions for the people at home. Okay, so we're back to this. Everybody good on pre the present value equation? Everybody good on treasury yield, yield curves? And I gave you the little spreadsheet simulation to, to prove it to you, that the formula works. What we are showing you are model portfolios of our top business partners who also maintain model portfolios. Austin is here and uh, from DFA, and I want to thank you for being here. 
Um, BlackRock's model portfolio, here's DFA, here's New Capital Management, here's Vanguard, here's the aggregate bond index, the S&P 500 of bonds, right? The, the, the index to which we compare other bonds, and Mira talked about the aggregate bond index, right? Remember she talked about that? You may have forgotten, but she, she used that. And this is the effective duration of the bond portion of model portfolios. Now, this is a big company, Vanguard, and BlackRock's a big company. DFA's not as big as them, but they're very big. And here we are. Who had the shortest bond portfolio? You guys. You guys did. DFA's pretty good. They really are. But look, Vanguard didn't do much to, to, to and, and this is not bad. They basically look a lot like the aggregate bond index, but we did not. We said, we're not going with the S&P 500 of the bonds. We're worried about interest rates. And we think that even a duration of six, you guys want to lose 6% of the value of your bond portfolio? How about, how about double that, 12%? Or 18%? You want to lose 18% of your money on, if it's a 60-40 portfolio, you want to lose 16 or 18% of your portfolio value on 40% of your portfolio? No. So there you go. Oh, I can push this. All right. I want to get in now to uh, some, uh, any questions about any of that? We kind of kind of come back to it, but I wanted to show you what's going on with bonds and I wanted to show you what we did. And what we did is we, we gave you short-term bonds, right? And it wasn't easy for a while because clients would say, well, I'm not earning any interest on this. And I would say, you're not, but I'm not willing to take the risk that we lose a lot more. I'm not willing to get you an extra dollar <laughs> over the 50 cents and subject you to the possibility that you lose $50 on the value of it. So what have markets done? A little bit of review. This is as of September 30th, so we're a month on from this. Um, and thanks to Dimensional, this is a chart they put out. Uh, back in September 30th, stocks over the prior one-year period, so September of 2022 to 2020, pretty good, 20% 20 up. We're down from there now but this is where things were. International stocks, I've been telling you for years to the point where the markets are making me look foolish that, that international stocks much cheaper and do to turn in different performance than they have, and we're, we're seeing that. International stocks outperform U.S. stocks. Less so emerging market stocks, but Europe, Australia, Canada, et cetera, a little bit stronger performance than U.S. stocks. Global real estate, for all the problems that real estate has had, uh, especially office building real estate and retail real estate, but not all real estate. Um, at the end of September, global real estate all over the world was actually eked out a 2% gain, and this is actually one of the more attractively valued areas, right? That's what happens when things get clobbered. They get cheaper. And the bond market, you can see, that the U.S. bond market in general, think about it as the aggregate at the end of September, up 0.64%. The global bond market actually stronger, another area where global diversification has been very, very helpful over the last year, is even in the bond market. I'm not going to get into the five and ten years, we're running a little behind. And so what do our portfolios uh, look like? performance-wise, when you put this together and this move that we made to keep your portfolios shorter in their bond duration, you can see that our model zero, which is all bonds, no stocks, outperformed, you, you lost money in the BlackRock uh, uh, model portfolio and you lost a little bit of money in the Vanguard portfolio. We were up and so is DFA. 
And one of the advantages of working with us is that, you know, we can pick from among our providers different funds, and we did that very much in this bond portfolio. Austin will tell you that, that, that DFA really has not had an ultra short-term bond portfolio ready for us to go with them during this period, so we used BlackRock's and J.P. Morgan's. Model 2, where it's 20% bonds and 80% stocks, we outperformed everybody. DFA, very strong here, positive here for BlackRock and Vanguard, but our model portfolio is stronger. And the reason I want to talk about model portfolios, and I'm going to do this every year, is because we went to model portfolios a couple of years ago. I owe it to you to tell you whether that's doing, is that good, right? Model four, we outperformed. Model six, we outperformed. We're third in line here in model eight, and the reason has to do that our equity allocation is more value oriented, and we've been in a period still where growth stocks have outperformed value, but it's not by much. A little more pronounced here in Model 10. So only in Model 10 are we the lowest of the performers, 100% stocks. Again, because our stock portfolio is more value oriented and these, even DFA, has a more growth oriented allocation. But on the whole, you can see what we're showing you is we protected you. This is where we're at uh, dating back. I always show the slide. This is J.P. Morgan's slide. And where we are here is year to date. As of really just the other day, uh, the S&P 500 is up 10%, so respectable for the year. And Mira talked about that. However, we've had a period during the year when it was down 8%. And what this slide shows is that every single year, you can pretty much count that at some point during the year, we're going to be negative, right? May not end there, right? But every, almost every single one of these years, you see markets can go negative and sometimes very significantly. So look at this. What is that year? 1987, I guess, when we had the big, this is the big, uh, um, what was it, Black Thursday, October, October of 1987. I was in college, and there it is. The market dropped 34%, but somehow ended the year up 2%. What a crazy year that was, huh? S&P 500 as of uh, October 23rd, um, as Mira was saying, not super cheap, you know, 17 and a half times earnings uh, right here, you know, versus um, um, there have been cheaper periods, of course. Dividend yield, 1.7, and the 10-year Treasury now is 4.9%. Look what it's been over these other periods, 2020, 2022, right? There's the 10-year Treasury. And what she was saying is that higher interest rates impact stocks, and you can see why higher interest rates impact stocks. Why? Because of the present value formula, right? That same interest rate that goes into the calculation of a bond value or goes into the calculation of a rent also goes into the calculation of stocks. So why are stocks down over the last couple of months? Because the I has gone up and the market wasn't prepared for it, and that decreased the present value of stocks. It's just math. Valuation on the S&P 500, 17 and a half. You see it's a little bit higher than 25 year average. So we're not cheap in what we would call large cap US stocks. This is the dispersion between the most expensive stocks trading at the highest uh, price to earnings ratio and the least expensive stocks. So we're anywhere from 10 times earnings to the most expensive up 20 something time earnings. And it's a pretty wide dispersion, but nowhere near what we were facing in 20 and 21. In other words, the difference between expensive and cheap has come in. Here are returns by category. Growth, there it is, large cap growth. That's what Mira was talking about. The big, you know, the Googles, et cetera, et al. 24.6% year to date. Value stocks have actually lost some ground. Blends, large cap blend, Coca-Cola, think about it as, you know, Coca-Cola, Walmart. 11.3%, but stronger performance in the growth areas here. And you've benefited from it. Our portfolios lean toward value, but they contain growth, significant amount. Small growth is actually down, 
But look at the valuations. This is the, always the paradox. The higher something goes, the less expensive it is. And you can see that large cap growth stocks are trading at 128% of their 20 year average on price to earnings. And that's what Miro was saying. Not cheap. 24 times earnings versus 18.8 on average versus these areas of the market. Small values trading at 78.9% of its 25 year average, 13.2 times earnings versus historical average of 16.7. So there are cheap areas of the market and we have you in them. Not completely, not 100%, but we have exposure to it. This is another way to control risk because where's the risk here? There's the risk. And you can see here's our equity style allocations in our model portfolios our portfolio actually has a larger allocation to value than the other models, right? In other words, we're taking advantage of these, more advantage, they're taking advantage of it, we're taking more advantage of these cheaper areas. The way I like to think about that is it's less risky. International. Look at this. We're at, you know, going back to 2003, a 31.7% discount on price to earnings ratio for international stocks versus the United States. We're now at three standard devi or sorry, two standard deviations away from the average. The average is usually that there's a 16% discount on international stocks to the US stocks. We're now at 31% discount. And look at the dividend yield. The difference in dividend yield is 1.8%. Historically, the difference is 1.2%. You're getting paid on average a 0.6% higher dividend amount on international stocks. This is showing you the different periods of outperformance, international versus US. US is in gray, international is in purple. And you see we're just starting, what, I, mean, I don't know, we'll see, it's just, will we get another one of these periods? It's possible. I would say we probably will just because of valuations. It's not that I don't love international more than U.S. I'm not a traitor to my country. It's just, you know, with the more expensive you get, the less likely you are to outperform. And you can see our portfolio has a higher allocation to international stocks than the other model portfolios. In other words, we're, we're making models for you that react to the realities of what we're seeing in the markets, strongly so, just as we did with interest rates on bonds. Yes, Ann. Do you think that the Federal Reserve is going to play heavily in the U.S. in setting the rate? The question for those at home is why do the other uh, models have a higher allocation to the U.S.? And the answer is it's called home bias. Investors tend to have a home bias. It's a great question. And BlackRock, Vanguard, and DFA are all expressing home bias because they think that's what their clients want. Is that right, Austin? Yeah, yeah I think that's correct. They think that's what their clients want. And if they're wrong, they can say, well, we were wrong by holding more U.S., you know, so you can't hold it against us. You know, we were, we were investing with your country, but we're not having that bias. <laughs> Our job is to get rid of that bias, right? Our job is to tell you wh wh why are we giving you this higher international allocation and to, tell you and, to, and to have a good reason for it. Valuation. And this is all about valuation. That's what this process of investment is about. It's always about price. Bob. Um, yeah, 60-40 portfolio, so this is, this is showing you just the equity percentage. Yeah, it's not showing you the bond, so, so uh, okay, the question, Bob asked the question, why does it not add up to 100%? Because we're showing you the absolute allocations to the, to the uh, asset classes we're basing this on a 60-40 por portfolio, which is the most common, most popular, and we're excluding the bond allocation, which is 40%. So what you're seeing in each of these is 60% allocations and how that 60% is allocated. 
It's a great question. All right. Any questions about this and where we're allocated with the models and why? We're not giving you a home bias in the United States. I love my country and there's great companies and so on, but it's not, it's not as cheap. You know, there's no reason why we wouldn't have you invested with, you know, LVMH, right? You know, or, or uh, Stellantis, the, uh, the car maker, or whoever. The U.S. doesn't have a patent on great managers and engineers and salespeople, you know. And we don't tend to think of investing internationally as investing internationally, at least in the equity space. We think of it as investing in great companies that happen to be located outside the United States. So why would I not invest you in great companies that just happen to be located outside the U.S.? Especially if they're trading at this massive discount, 33%. Uh, Kelly had a question. Higher. The dividend yield is 1.8% higher, so you're getting paid over 3% dividend in international stocks. U.S. dividends are under 2%, 1 point something, and so you're getting paid a higher dividend. It seems too good to be true, but it's the situation, and so, Bob. The dividend yield? You're saying the dividend? Well, I'm just looking at results from the standpoint of the model. And I guess my question is, did Vanguard put their model together and whatever? We all, we all, we all, uh, we all tweak them. Okay, sorry. How often do the models get updated? Everybody's different. DFA, how often do you guys do your models? Probably once a month or something like that. Quarterly. BlackRock does it regularly, Vanguard. So everybody's updating their models. Uh, JC and I meet. We may not make a change to the model, and we haven't. This whole year we've been like, do we add duration now? Do we add duration? Do we, go, do we, do we add more long-term bonds? Are we done with the interest rate increases? And so we've done nothing. But we've, <laughs> we've met and talked about it, and, and, and that's, the, that's what has to happen. So you know, there's the meeting and then there's the changes. And a meeting doesn't necessarily lead to a change, but a meeting can lead to a change, and pretty soon the meeting's going to lead to a change. Could be this year. I'm going to skip this. Uh, this is showing you that, that yields on all types of bonds, the, the current blue diamond is where yields on bonds are, and the, the uh, bar shows you the range from lowest to highest over the last 10 years and you can see almost all kinds of bonds whether it's municipals, treasuries, emerging market bonds, high yield bonds they're all trading right now with yields that are toward the top of the last 10 years which means what? Right, say it again Rodney? It means the price is lower which means bonds are a lot better deal here than they were down here, right? Or down here. This is federal budget deficit. I'm not going to talk about this slide. Everybody's thinking about, you know, what's the borrowing? Well, you can see here's what it's going to cost now the U.S. government to pay higher interest right here on federal finances. I just threw that in so you can see, to, you know, here's, here's the spending and here's the sources of where the money comes from in taxes. And right there, yes, it's big. There you see it. Okay, themes. In 2021, uh, this is a look back. How did we do on our predictions looking back to 2021? In 2021, we were shifting to defense. Valuations were high, and that was exactly the right thing to do, both in bonds and stocks, because 2022 last year brought bad year for both stocks and bonds. And so we, we, we got defensive. I've been talking about that now this whole talk. Well, what did defensive mean in bonds? We didn't get rid of bonds. We didn't sell all your bonds and put you into stocks. What did we do? We went short on the bonds. That's defensive. We were right. We were worried about inflation and interest rate risk. I gave us two check marks because we were way, way right on both of those. This is October of 2021. We were worried about political risk. That, you know, kind of ever-present now, omnipresent even. And we were worried about valuation risks. 
Last year's conference, we were gingerly shifting to offense because we'd had, we'd had a, uh, um, a uh, big drawdown in markets, and so we did some shifting to offense, but not a lot. It was we were keeping duration short. We were still worried about interest rates rising in the future. Gave us two check marks on that. We talked about recession risk. I didn't, I didn't have a strong feeling either way, but it was, it was something that was present. Um, I didn't feel it was going to materialize. I'm giving us an X just because we mentioned it, but I didn't, I didn't make any bets on it. And of course, there's the ever-present political risk, and I guess it'll be with us. So this year, themes, and then we're going to, uh, we're pretty much right on. Um, we are, we're going to be adding duration back. Exactly when I don't know. It could be, could be next month. You know, it could be December. It could be January. We're going to start to put duration back. Everybody understands why we would do that? Why would we begin to say, okay, we're willing to, to go a little longer on bonds, to lock in what are now much higher interest rates on longer-term bonds and give you that long-term yield? The danger with short-term bonds is that short-term bond rates could fall. If the Fed starts to cut interest rates and the economy slows, short-term rates could come down and come down fast, and so suddenly you know, you were getting 5%. Everybody loves it. I love showing you all your statements and showing you all the dividends you're getting in interest now, right? I'm loving those meetings. You guys got nothing for a long time. I'm showing $10,000 and $50,000 and, you know, $100,000 in dividends. It's great. But we could get caught if short-term rates drop precipitously, and so we may want to add some duration to that. We will be adding duration back. Valuations are attractive in a bunch of areas. It's, it's not... It's not it's not at all a situation where we can't find areas to buy. In bonds themselves, just talking about that, international value is still well priced. And in, in, in real estate, political risk, <laughs> it's still there. And now, you know, there's a lot of geopolitical risk that, that, that has been there, and I'm sorry to say is now amped up even higher. So those are the themes going into the next year that we'll be working on, and you'll, you'll see that the models will um, incorporate this and reflect that as we make changes. And no doubt, the meetings will turn into trades over the next few months. You'll see that happen. Bob, you asked about that. Okay, any, any questions? We're right, at, am I right on time? It's unheard of. Okay, thank you. <laughs>